Yeah, n nothing on dormancy today. So in case you didn't like that topic, uh, maybe I can try to change things up a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, so I think the thing that's been interesting about the, this meeting so far, and I have, to, I have to leave today, so if I don't get a chance to meet and chat with all of you, I apologize, but um, you, know, you kind of get a sense of how people approach different problems differently, uh, thinking about cellular biology and physiology, metabolism, communities, maybe how they function. And so the way in which we kind of collectively approach those problems comes from like two ways, right? We, we, can, we can take top-down approaches where uh, we can look at patterns and have hypotheses and kind of reject what might happen based on maybe the distribution of abundance of species. And we can take computational approaches, comparative approaches, statistical approaches. Uh, and, and we do that kind of work, too. I, I really like that. And then there's sort of the other way in which uh, biologists tend to approach uh, complexity in life, which is to try to break things, right? Like we, we find some gene of unknown function, and we can uh, remove it, put it back in, see if we can get things to work. Um, and you know, and through that process, maybe we can find some generalities about how a system works. And maybe together, those two approaches, we can kind of come up with some um, model for, for, for about the complexity of life and some rules that we can use for you know, prediction and understanding um, and such. So, so I, I see some of that going on here this week. And I, I'm going to decidedly today take a, a different approach, which is more of this bottom-up approach, which our group doesn't always necessarily do. But in this particular example, um, it was, it was interesting uh, to us. So um, I'm going to talk about the evolution of a minimal cell uh, for people who don't, aren't familiar with that concept. Um, it's the idea that there might be a form of life that only has the uh, essential genes that are needed for basic um, functioning property of life, being able to metabolize, divide, and uh, conduct homeostasis of a single cell autonomous form of life. Um, so, so one type of complexity that is important in cell biology is reflected in the, the genomes of organisms. And there's different ways that we can look at the complexity of a genome. But one is, uh, is its, its size. So taking the sum of all A's, T's, C's, and G's in a genome. And when we do that, there, there's a lot of variation across the tree of life, uh, spanning 10 orders of magnitude. Um, so some of the simplest uh, biological entities on the planet, which have the most streamlined genomes, are things like single-stranded DNA viruses. Uh, they all may have a handful of genes, maybe 1,000 or two uh, total genes, base pairs. Um, so those are the simplest. Of course, those organisms can't live on their own. They're, they're, they're persisting through the you know, infection and taking over the cellular machinery of their, their hosts. Uh, but on the other end of the spectrum, there are some organisms, uh, like the marbled lungfish, that have upwards of uh, 100 billion uh, base pairs in their genome, so, so 10 to the power 11, uh, and uh, tens of thousands of genes. So there's a lot of variation in the essential core material and information that makes up an organism. And what I'm showing on the, on the left is a, a, a scaling relationship between uh, genome size and protein coding genes. And it's generally positive. But if you see in the upper right-hand quadrant, the, the orange colored dots, those are all for, for eukaryotes. And so this relationship becomes sublinear uh, due to the fact that protein coding genes are going down in those organisms with larger genomes due to the retention of things like introns and other types of what sometimes people would call junk DNA that might not actually be contributing to the performance or function of an organism. And so there's questions about how that information, why it's retained, if it has any function, uh, so the maintenance of genome structure, but also, again, the consequences of what, what all those A's, T's, G's, and C's mean for the performance, uh, the ability of an organism to be a generalist and live and, and tolerate different environmental conditions, for example. So um, I'm going to talk about a synthetic bio biological approach to um, investigating questions related to genome complexity and genome size in particular. Um, so this is a relatively new field, depending how you define it, that's been around for maybe a decade or two, uh, that draws on um, principles and ideas from different fields. Um, Um, so, so drawing on fields of, of genetics, molecular biology, um, engineering, physics, computer science. And uh, generally what the, the, the goal of synthetic biology is, is to, to modify an organism, to use its parts, 
modules, circuits that could either be constructed or deconstructed to create an organism that can perform some function uh, that's useful typically for society, right? So it could be, can we create new drugs? And can we create them at a yield that might be economical? Can we, um, can we create an organism that might aid in, for example, bioremediation of, a, of, a, of an oil spill? Or are there new crops that we could create that might be tolerant to environmental stressors that are associated with global climate change? So these are some of the questions that, uh, applied questions that synthetic biologists might ask. Uh, but I'm gonna argue that I think we can also use synthetic biology to address uh, basic uh, questions in, in biology and specifically in evolution. So I'm gonna talk about how people have used synthetic biology to uh, create a minimal cell to address basic questions in, in biology, and cell biology and evolution. Um, and so this question has been around for quite some time, actually, probably since the early 80s. And the question, uh, this came up yesterday in one of our seminars, the idea of the analogy of uh, the hydrogen atom, right? So when I've heard this story and the motivation behind this work, people have said if we want to understand uh, quantum theory of an atom, you, you know, you would not start with uranium. You would start with something that is much similar. We have one proton, one electron, and we can describe orbitals and come up with um, um, you know, equations that can describe this simple uh, atom, and then we can start to build up and understand the diversity of elements within the periodic table. Um, and so the, the motivation for having a minimal cell was that this would be you know, perhaps an equivalent of, of a hydrogen atom for, for cell biology. What are the minimal, the bare minimal elements, components needed for a self-sustaining autonomous form of life? And so they started to build a, a candidate list of species that could be used for constructing a minimal cell back in the 1980s. And uh, this one group of bacteria that uh, showed up on this list that they did identify as being a potentially good uh, organism to start with were bacteria called mycoplasmas. Um, so these are groups, it's a class of bacteria um, in, the, in the molecules. Um, none of these organisms have cell walls, uh, and they tend to be commonly associated uh, with hosts, often pathogenic. Um, so we find them in humans, we find them in um, non-human uh, primate populations, uh, and in ungulates, in goats in particular where they form uh, pathogenic relationships and infections in the upper respiratory tract and urinary tract of those, of those organisms. And so over, uh, like other endosymbiotes and symbiotic bacteria, these aren't endosymbiotes, but other symbiotic bacteria, over millions of years, what happens through this close association is that microorganisms uh, provide some benefit to the host, but they're also getting something from the host, usually metabolites. And so what this does is this kind of relaxed selection on certain genes within the genome of the microbe, um, and that there, over time, you can see the, the loss of, uh, of genetic information, the deterioration of traits over millions of years of evolution, resulting in streamlining or genome reduction of many host-associated microorganisms. Um, so this is common, um, and it basically means in the end that a lot of those organisms can't be free living anymore. Uh, but many mycoplasmas still have streamlined genomes, but do have the ability to live on their own. So now we have some candidate organisms with, with small genomes that perhaps we can even minimize further. That's the idea. So um, in the 2000s, uh, early 2000s, uh, at the Venture Institute in San Diego, people started to develop a platform where they could manipulate the genomes of mycoplasma. And the idea was that you could create a synthetic organism by coming up with a list of genes uh, in silico and constructing uh, synthetically chemical chromosomes, which could be transplanted into vectors like E. coli or yeast, assemble those genomes, and then move those genomes in their entirety into another species that lacked a chromosome, just the, the, just the cell uh, membrane of a, of a vacant cell. And so now what you've effectively done is you've, you've, you've booted up a new form of life from the computer. And so when they did this for um, some of the mycoplasma cells, the quote from Craig Venter was, this is, these are the only species on Earth whose parents were a computer. Um, so it, in 2016, some of this was published, and it was uh, you know, kind of touted as being a really a major breakthrough in cell biology and synthetic biology. Um, yeah, and so, so um, it was around this time that I, I, I was at a Gordon conference in New England in 2018, and Clyde Hutchinson, the, the lead author on this work, had given a talk. And, um, it was a good talk. 
And in the end, we, we understood what was essential for you know, creating a synthetic organism that, that they could only live off the essential genes. And the way this is done, just, just to back up a second, is there's a process called uh, global transposon mutagenesis. So they had a wild type organism that had uh, approximately one million base pairs and uh, 901 total genes. And they used this global transposon mutagenesis to knock out uh, one at a time every single gene. And then you would score whether or not that mutant uh, was viable or not. Okay? So if, if, a, if you did a mutation in one of those 901 genes, uh, randomly, and that gene was mutated and it couldn't form a colony, then it was determined to be essential. And you have to keep it. If you delete another gene of the 901 and the colony still forms, then you know that that's a non-essential uh, mutation. And you could toss that out. So I was wondering uh, how environment dependent this definition of minimal cell is. Um, and it sounds like they went for the environment of uh, colony growth. So yeah. does this mean everything else you have to do in colonies? So well, it's, it's a very important and good question. Um, so when we first started doing this work, we were talking about the evolution of the minimal cell. And we uh, quickly realized that, this, that that was not appropriate. It's not the minimal cell. It's a minimal cell. And it's dependent and conditional upon the, the, the techniques that you use for selection, the growth media, the conditions, the pH, the temperature. Uh, I not, not thought about the, the, the selection process of, of thinking about colonies forming on plates, but yes, that would be another thing that would describe what this minimal cell is. It's a really important point. We could create other minimal cells. I've been kind of interested in like, whether or not this model could be useful for thinking about origins of life, because we know that life probably evolved from simpler means. But this is like a chemo organo heterotroph. It uses oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor, and it lives in association with uh, ungulates that probably evolved you know, a few hundred, uh, you know, hundred million years ago. Right? So it's probably not a good model for that. But I was, you know, last week I was traveling in Zurich, and we were talking to people about, well, why, what could we do this for a chemolithoautotroph? Right? that would have a small genome. And might that be a better model for thinking about origins of life uh, through this process of simplification and genome minimization, yeah. So that would be an example of another minimal cell that you could create. This is the only one we have right now, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Jay, the, the way you described the evolution of these, these mycoplasma cells, um, do you think um, you could only you know, take an E. coli cell and put it in a chemostat and just you know, wait for 20 years and you arrived at a minimal cell for this, for this sort of environment, the, the chemostat I mean, environment? Um, you know, so we, we mentioned some of the work by Rich Lenski and crew. They, they've been evolving under semi-batch conditions, semi-continuous culture for, what, 90,000, close to, you know, approaching a, 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 you know, 100,000 generations. I don't think there's been any evidence for massive uh, genome reduction in those. There is gene loss, but not at the, you know, the magnitude that we're seeing. So I don't think the time scale of, of PhD students or, or faculty <laughs> even that that would be uh, the way we would want to go about. But, but yeah, at some point, uh, if you relax selection under those conditions that you're suggesting, you should perhaps see some erosion of genes. But it might take thousands or millions of years to, to see that. Yeah. Uh, OK. So. Um, yeah, so we have two cells now. We have uh, this non-minimal cell, uh, which is in blue. And then you can see on the inner side is the genome of the non-minimal cell. And there's a lot of gaps uh, in the architecture of this genome. Uh, basically, that's where all of the non-essential genes were removed, OK? And we're going to contrast the performance and evolution of those two cells. There's obviously, I want to point out, there, there's a shared component too, right? All of the essential genes between those two, the blue and the red strings, are shared. It's just the, the you know, sort of a nestedness that we've removed all these non-essential genes. Yeah. I was thinking, what about genes that are not essential on their own, but they're essential when coupled to other genes? Like, there could be a gene that, like, if I remove gene A, the, the, the cells are still viable. If I remove 
gene B singularly, the cells are still viable. But yeah. if, I, if I remove, I mean, sorry, if I remove any of them, the, the cells are not viable, yeah. but if I have both of them, the cells are viable. Like, yeah. did they so look into this? Or? So this is some kind of epistasis. Yeah, you yes. know, I, I was actually, I had to admit that I was thinking about this this morning, and I wanted to look this up. So, you know, was this done sequentially, and in what order was it done, and would that determine what genes were essential or non-essential? And I don't know if this was all done at like one time where you could have different transposons that were mutated across and you just screened all cells, or if it was literally done one gene at a time. And I have to, I'd have to go back and, and refresh my memory on that. But, but I do think about And Sorry, maybe you mentioned that, but do we know the function of all uh, these 500 genes that are left? What, what are the uh, functions? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, I, w I can't summarize all of them because it would be about, uh, you know, roughly 500 genes. But um, anything that, I mean, there are a lot of things that are important that are removed and that are especially important for, for, for evolution. So it's like repair of, of mutations, uh, any kind of accessory genes that aren't essential for life. And so there's a long list of them. Uh, and there, I'm going to also say that there are some genes that they did define that are quasi-essential. Things that affected the performance and the ability to work with this organism in the lab that the choices were made to retain them, even though technically you could get a cell to, to, to live and divide, it just wasn't really made it, made it difficult to do experiments with. And one of those genes I'm going to talk about is, is really important and is involved in cell division and the evolution of cell size. So, so but th there's only like maybe a dozen of those genes. Okay. So, so I'm going to, uh, you know, what are the questions that we had? Um, so, so I meant to go back to this Gordon Research Conference where I'm talking to Clyde Hutchinson, and it's just this marvel of being able to make this cell. Uh, but as soon as the cell was made, it was put in uh, glycerol or whatever cryopreservant and, and placed in minus 80. They didn't want to domesticate this organism. They wanted to keep it the way it was, the way they constructed it. And I think this is the, uh, a bit of the mindset of an engineer, right? You, you want, you've created this device, a synthetic cell, uh, and you want to maintain it in its pristine form. So I asked Clyde, well, what would happen if you let this cell go? What would happen to it? And I don't think it was a question, well, he told me it was not a question that had ever come to his mind. So there's a lot of money, a lot of effort, huge teams that went into being able to make this minimal cell. But the, the follow-up question was one that, particular for me, as an ecologist and evolutionary biologist, is how is this organism going to uh, behave, perform subsequently? when? It has no redundancies, no degrees of freedom, right? And, and what's going to happen as soon as you start to grow this organism? Uh, invariably, there will be mutations that will arise, and it's going to hit only an essential gene. So if those are deleterious, which most mutations are, then you would expect that perhaps this would compromise the, the, the robustness of this cell and perhaps even lead populations to extinction. Um, you could imagine that would be the case. Um, so, so I was really interested in, in this idea, um, and I, I talked to Clyde immediately on the spot, and I was like, can you send me these cells, expecting that maybe they wouldn't be so keen to do that? It's like, sure. So within uh, uh, one month, uh, they had, we had got our USDA permits, and we had JCVI send us these cells. And we wanted to um, address two, two fundamental questions. One could be, uh, the first one is related to mutations. Uh, that arise in these populations. There's two reasons to know this. If you're a synthetic biologist, you've gone to all this work and you've got this minimized cell, and if mutation rates are, are really off the charts, uh, then maybe this will kind of erode the function of the, the desired function and performance of your cell. Uh, so that would be, be bad for, for practical purposes. But it's also important if we want to understand the evolution of a minimal cell to know what's going on in terms of inputs of mutations, because this could be really important for, for driving the evolutionary dynamics of this population. So we wanted to characterize the rate and the spectrum of mutations that are uh, arising and whether or not that differs for an organism that's undergone extreme genome streamlining. Question one. Question two, as I already kind of suggested, is that because there's no degrees of freedom and there's no redundancies, uh, then, then this could potentially constrain adaptation. And uh, from other systems uh, outside of microbes, we know that a lot of adaptive evolutionary changes be occur in, in non-essential and accessory uh, genes. And we've eliminated all those. So, so we could hypothesize, we did hypothesize, that the, uh, the ability uh, and the way in which the minimal cell uh, adapts 
uh, would be different from that of the non-minimal cell from which it was synthetically derived. Yeah, just out of curiosity, um, did they look into the fact that um, um, this, this minimal um, cell basically lacks a lot of genes, so does it have a growth advantage? Um, so that could be an alternative hypothesis. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. And it turn, I don't want to give away the punchline just yet, but maybe there are some advantages. And, and it, it's hard to, I, I don't have data to, um, to speak specifically to that question, but you might imagine that there, there could be certain things. Well, the interpretation could be the alternate. This is good. So um, maybe an organism is constrained through the process of genome streamlining, but there's also, we learned yesterday, a lot of things that are going on in the cell, a lot of random proteins that are interacting, and that perhaps with less material, uh, maybe this opens up some opportunities for adaptive evolution uh, due to the, cons you know, just, just noise and complexity in this cell. I, that, 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 that was brought up in the review process of this work. So we needed an alternate explanation for the results I'm about to show you. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, I'm going to talk about two experiments. Um, the first was, you know, experimentally, maybe these aren't as exciting, but this addresses the question about uh, inputs of mutations. We did what's called a mutation accumulation uh, experiment. Uh, and classically in evolution, what you would do is you'd, you'd, you'd breed inbred lines, you'd passage them over time through, through bottlenecking uh, under conditions that are supposed to uh, relax selection, allowing for neutral uh, and, and mildly deleterious, but not lethal genes or mutations to accumulate through this bottlenecking process over time. And what this allows you to do is to estimate the, the spontaneous mutation rate. Okay, so this has been done for a lot of other organisms. Uh, it's also been done for microbes, and the way you do it is you grow up a population of cells, and you uh, plate them out on a Petri dish, and you pick an indiv one random individual colony from that plate. You grow it up, you plate it out again. Pick a random colony, grow it up, and so it's going through repeated bottlenecks, but you're also maintaining uh, populations at very low sizes, so that if there are any deleterious mutations that arise, it's not going to be experiencing selection from its neighbors. So we did that for 87 replicate lines or lineages uh, for the, the, the um, non-minimal cell and 57 uh, uh, lineages for the non-minimal cell. We passage those for about half a year. And then at the end of the experiment, we grow those cells up, extract nucleic acids, and we, uh, we, we map the reads back onto the reference genome, and we, we uh, classify mutations. And we know how many divisions uh, and generations occurred during that time point. So we can express the mutation rate um, in terms of uh, mutations per nucleotide per generation. Uh, so this figure doesn't, at the surface, look all that interesting, but there's two important things or interesting things to me that, that emerged from this. Uh, one, the we expected that mutation rates would be higher in the non-minimal cell because we've removed all of these non-essential genes that are important for uh, correcting mutations that would arise, like mismatch repair, uh, and that's not the case. The, the statistically, the mutation rates here are comparable. But the thing that is sort of noteworthy is that the mutation rates were exceptionally high. These are the highest mutation rates uh, recorded for any free-living organism ever. So there's a lot, of, a lot of mutations coming into the population. The non-minimal cell was the original ancestor that they had in, the, in their study, that they deleted everything? The, um, so the blue dots are referred to the non-minimal cell, and that was synthetically created, but it contains all the genes before, okay. prior to minimization. And the red are the ones that was also a synthetically constructed cell, but it had all the non-essential genes removed. So you, okay. So you can't, so, okay, okay. And so now we're just measuring the rate at which new mutations arise in this population over this experiment. And the rates are high, but there's no, no effective genome streamlining. The, the mutation rates are the same. They're comparable. And so by mutation rate, do you also take into account like synonymous mutation and stuff like that? Because this you would expect not to have an effect on sort of the viability of the genes, right? So. Yeah, so there's no, we're kind of not really worrying about fitness of the, the mutations. We're trying to create an environment where we passage them where the, those 
um, uh, cells that arise that have mutations that are not lethal will be able to be continued to be passage. And I, I, I'm saying that because I thought I understood from what you were saying that you would expect the minimal cell to have a lower mutation rate due to the fact that they only have essential genes. But of course, if you're looking at synonymous mutation, this shouldn't play a role, right? Um, because you wouldn't change the function of your gene since the synonymous mutation are not changing the amino acids that end up in the protein. Uh, so you're saying silent mutations. Uh, yeah, these are total number of mutations, yeah. Uh, so maybe it's, maybe yeah. you would observe a different effect. Yeah, we do, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I understand. So ju just to be sure that I understand, so this is like, uh, to be like, um, more precise, is the non-lethal mutation rate. So the mutation rate that gives rise to mutations that are non-lethal. That's right. Independent of their fitness effect. That's right. Okay. And, and we don't, I don't know of any other really good ways to measure like the mutations that would arise that would uh, be lethal. But, but presumably they're happening, and maybe they're happening at a higher rate in the minimal cell. Yeah. Hi. So here you just mentioned that both of these are synthetic cells. Yeah. So was any comparison done with the non-synthetic version of the non-minimal cell? We didn't do that. You, you could imagine that there's a lot of comparisons you could make. There are other mycoplasma cells that could be used in comparison. But we, we thought that um, for this experiment, we just took the synthetic non-minimal cell and the synthetic non-minimal cell. So is there a possibility that the mutation rate is similar because these are both synthetic? Yeah. I mean, it could be. I mean, the content of the non-minimal cell is, uh, as I understand, identical to the non-synthetic minimal cell. But there, there could be uh, perhaps something that happens in this, the process of synthesis. But it's not surprising that the, the mutation rates are high. That's pretty uh, typical for um, uh, organisms that are undergoing massive natural genome. So, so it wasn't surprising to us that the mutation rates were high. And in fact, the reason why we probably don't see an effect of the non-minimal cell is that the baseline mutation rate for this organism is just really elevated because of its small effective population size. Yeah. Sorry, Jay, I, I realized that I, I, I didn't understand um, how the ancestor cell, in what way is it syn synthetic? I'm sure you said it. In yeah, so what, what, what you do is it's the same process. It's just when one cell has, um, it's been a, a, in silico, the construction of the genome contained all of the uh, essential and non-essential genes of the wild type, and the non-minimal cell has, uh, was synthetically created without any of the non-essential genes. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, Jay, for um, a lot of population genetic work, I, I didn't ask this question when I was in your lab and doing this, but uh, for a lot of population genetic work, it's not so much the per-base mutation rate that matters or even like the genome scaled rate. It's that per-base rate times genome size times the size of the population as the input of mutations per generation. Yeah. And so, I mean, you do evolution experiments. You just say that the size of the population is effectively the bottlenecked yeah. population. Yeah. Um, but so once you, if you were to take these quantities, multiply them by genome sizes, and then multiply them by the typical population size um, for a given environment, how would those uh, affect, how would those compound parameters compare for the two uh, bugs? Um, so I, I think population sizes are comparable yeah. uh, in, a, in a subsequent experiment. So we, we think they both get to about 10 to the 7 cells per mil. Um, the, the thing that maybe, when you asked this question, that I, I cued in on was, is this, th these are reported on per, per base pair. So the genome of the non-minimal cell is twice right. the size. So maybe, if, if I understand your question, and I'm not sure if this is expressed here, is that the, uh, there might be a factor of two difference? Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I don't think that would be, I don't know if that would fundamentally change. We're looking at an arithmetic axis, so maybe it would change things. A bit. No, that's, that's good, yeah. though, because then it yeah. means that for evolution experiments, they're roughly in the same parameter regime for that uh, yeah. important variable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this is, th I'm, this is great to get some questions. Th this was like, I was, I was like, is this really interesting? I think it's interesting. This is sort of like, we have to, it's a prerequisite. We have to figure out, like, what's going on if, you know, mutation inputs are different. So, the other thing that we, we, we did is we, um, 
Uh, we want to know about the spectrum of mutation. And so for people who aren't familiar with that uh, nomenclature, we're just looking at the composition or the differences in the types of mutations that are entering these populations. Um, and so this is, we're looking at categories of insertions, deletions, and single nucleotide <laughs> mutations. And the proportion of those mutations uh, arising in the non-minimal and the, non in the minimal genomes are the same. Um, but we see that uh, most of the mutations entering the populations are single nucleotide mutations, about uh, 90 percent. So we wanted to look at those in a little bit more detail. Um, and so what we have now are three panels that are characterizing the classes of different types of bias that can arise um, in, in types of single nucleotide mutations. So in the middle would be just like there's no, no effect, there's changes, but there are neutral effects. Uh, there can be mutations that give rise to GC bias. We don't see many of those. Most of the mutations that we see result in AT bias. This is pretty common among bacteria and archaea in general. So that wasn't surprising. But in this panel over here, where we have Cs and Gs going to Ts and As, we see that there's a 30-fold discrepancy in, in that type of uh, transition mutation. Uh, so, we, so we wanted to try to see if we could come up with some explanation for that discrepancy. Uh, there's a mutation, uh, there's an essential gene called UNG, which is DNA uh, glycosylase. So when uh, cytosine becomes deaminated, so there's a loss of an amine group, um, this can be, lead to a replacement of that with a uracil. And then in subsequent uh, rounds of DNA replication, you can get adenines that will fall into its place. So, so that, that gene and what it does and how it corrects for these types of base uh, pair excision can, is consistent with what we know about at least one uh, type of DNA repair gene that was removed from the minimal cell. Um, but the conclusion from all this is effectively two. One is that the mutation rates are really high. We're estimating that every single site in that genome is getting mutated four times per day. So that's a pretty big mutational burden or load, potentially. Uh, and we do see some bias in spectrum. There's a lot of more uh, single nucleotide mutations that are going to give uh, uh, rise to AT bias. Um, but by and large, we didn't see, like, fundamentally that, that, that the genome and the mutational input should be, like, dramatically altered um, through the process of removing 50 percent of an organism's genome. So, so at this point, we're now thinking about moving away. We've characterized what's, what's coming into a population due to the effects of genome minimization. The second thing that we wanted to now explore is, is uh, to what degree is this minimal cell able to undergo adaptive evolution? And th that's different than what we just talked about with mutation accumulation, where we're trying to estimate like inputs of spontaneous mutations. So, so now we're going to move into the direction of trying to understand how this organism, after undergoing genome streamlining, is it constrained in its ability to evolve and adapt? That's the question. Are there genes that stay um, uh, that are not mutated, or genes that are less that mutate le uh, less than other genes? So there is a distribution of rate of you. Can you find out this out? The question is about the first bullet point. Each size, so it's average. It, That's it, the average. Yes. Yeah. So we know how many mutations, uh, what the mutation rate is. We know what the size is, and we assume that mutations are, are random, are occurring at random. And so this is the average, is the estimate for the average number of time each gene should get a mutation. But I guess you can check whether this average is a good characterization, or, or is there are yeah. genes that are less mutated than others. That's something you can check because perhaps yeah. there are genes that, if you mutate this gene, the cell, the, the cell actually die. Yeah, that, we talked a little bit about that. I think that's a hard thing to, to know, to estimate what are lethal mutations. But I have an experiment where we're going to do an adaptive evolution experiment where we sequence and we can look at where, what genes um, get mutated. So, um, but on, this is just to be on average. We know what the total rate is. We know what the size is. How many times, on average, assuming mutations are random, should each gene get uh, hit per, uh, per day? And it's, it's high. And remember, we're, no degrees of freedom. These are all essential genes. So what, the question is, what are the consequences of that? Um, so uh, I described this two days ago. It's a, it's a similar, uh, and it's a common approach of using experimental evolution, where instead of uh, maintaining populations at low sizes, we allow them to reach uh, large population sizes, around 10 to the 7 per mil. And then every day, we just passage 1% uh, of those cells into a new, um, and into a new vessel. And so there, under, there is some bottlenecking that's going on, 
uh, but, but the population sizes are large. And we know that large population sizes should uh, favor uh, 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 deterministic changes in adaptation uh, of these strains as they're experiencing mutations in the population. So we start off in the beginning with the ancestor. We created four replicate populations. Perhaps we could do more. Um, and then we just uh, passage them over time. And about every 30 generations or so, I think, we would take a population and put it in a, a tube and freeze it so that we could resurrect it later. We could characterize its, um, its fitness and other phenotypic properties. And then um, at the end of the experiment, we had uh, extracted DNA. And again, using pool population sequencing, we could look at the mutations that arose under these conditions that should favor um, uh, 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 adaptive evolution. So that's the experiment. Uh, is, that, is everyone okay with, with those, uh, that, that type of study and approach? Um, so I think this might be, um, I don't know, maybe the, one of the main uh, results from the, from, the, from the paper that we worked on. This is work that I did with Roy Moser Reicher, who's a PhD student in my lab at the time. Um, and so what we did is we wanted to measure the relative fitness of these strains. And I'm just showing you what the relative fitness was at the beginning of the experiment and what it was at the end of the experiment. We have other um, high, higher resolution ways of measuring fitness. Um, and, and that's sort of relevant because uh, you might ask, well, what's going on in between those 2,000 generations? So about three, 300 days we passaged these cells. Um, are those relationships of fitness change over time, are they linear? Uh, do they take on some power law relationship, which has been described in the long-term evolution experiments of Rich Lenski, et cetera? Uh, and you'll have to trust me, or I can show you later, that the, the rates of uh, change in adaptation over time are linear. So this is just a simple way of looking at what happened by looking at the beginning and the, at the end of the experiment. And there's uh, a couple things I want to uh, emphasize. Number one, um, ah, there it is. Slow. <laughs> Uh, so we do these competition experiments where we have an independent reference, reference, reference strain, which is the non-minimal cell. And it, it has a, a red fluorescent protein fused into its genome. So we can put that marker strain in combination with other strains. We start off at 50-50 densities. We let those incubations go uh, for a day. And we measure the, the frequencies of those cells after 24 hours. And from that, we can estimate the, the fitness of those organisms obtained from different conditions. So you'll, you'll note that the relative fitness of the non-minimal, that's what we started from, its relative fitness is one, right? So everything is kind of referenced to that, that starting point. And if we look in this column here at the ancestor, what we can infer from this is that genome minimization resulted in a very sick cell. So there's a 50% reduction in the relative fitness due to reducing the genome of that organism down to its bare essential. And that's consistent with just being able to do work with these cells in lab. It was not easy. Like, they're just not happy. When we got them shipped from JCVI, it was really difficult just to kind of tweak the right conditions in our laboratory to get them to kind of to grow. You can't measure these things with optical density, um, so you have to come up with different ways to quantify cells. Uh, we use flow cytometry here. But there's a, a big cost to genome reduction. And then uh, what we see, observation two, is that all of those fitness costs are regained in 2,000 generations. So here I'm comparing that symbol to this symbol, right? There's no difference quantitatively, 100% fitness regain in 2,000 generations. So um, this is not consistent with our expectation or prediction that, um, that the minimal cell's ability to evolve would be hampered. It seems to be gotten better very quickly. And now, uh, if you will, those lines that connect those points, those vectors, those aren't statistical lines, those are just for I, but we can see, and I have other data to, to, to back this up, is the rates of adaptation are the same, statistically. If anything, in this, this figure, they're actually the minimal cell evolves a little bit faster than a non-minimal cell. So that's sort of interesting. Um, and maybe this isn't a good hypothesis, but what we were thinking at the time is like, well, maybe they're adapting via selection on the shared genes, which are only essential. That would be different from what most people in evolution think, that adaptation happens due to mutations in, in non-essential or accessory genes. But the, given the, the, the common pattern of those slopes, 
led us to hypothesis that maybe, despite genome minimization, these two cells are evolving via the same mechanisms. So we, uh, we, we sequenced the genomes of these organisms at the end of the experiment, and the results suggest that that's not the case. Um, so there were about 14 in one group and 18 genes in another that we call putatively under positive selection. Uh, those genes were ones where uh, the mutations went to 100 percent frequency in the population. And we also used a, st a statistical approach where we, um, this is similar to some work that, uh, that Will has done, I don't know if he'll talk about it later today, where you can uh, uh, take into account gene size and you can create a random distribution of mutations by throwing them on the genome and creating an expectation of uh, how, many, how many mutations you would expect to see in a gene under a, a random null model. And then you can compare that to the observed number of hits on each of the genes that you saw. And from that, we see that there are a lot of over-enrichment of hits on genes under certain conditions. And we, 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 we infer that that's a, a signature of positive selection. So that gives us 14 versus 18 candidate genes that may be important in the adaptation of these cells over the 2,000 generations. Problem is, uh, they, to, re, you know, to looking at that pattern of shared adaptive uh, changes in those rates, what we see is the genes are com completely different. And we're only comparing essential genes here. So um, there are divergent mechanisms of adaptation that are arising. Some of them fall into uh, similar categories like DNA replication and transcription in both groups. Uh, we thought that maybe the minimal cell where we would see mutations and transport et cetera, a membrane. We, we don't see, that, we actually did not see that. In the, non, in the minimal cell, we see mutations in ATP and and lipid metabolism. So just, you know, divergent ways in which these organisms are undergoing adaptation based on sequence data. That's uh, very, very interesting. Um, so can you say um, or guess if the mutations on, on, in the minimal cell are loss of function or just uh, adaptation of the, say, function level? Um, I haven't thought about this. So, so let's work through it. So the, if it were a loss of function in an essential gene, uh, that would be problematic, right? Well, I'm thinking again that this is a different environment than the one that you use to define a minimal cell. Same media, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, maybe there's some subtle differences. And so you, what you're saying is that we defined essential genes in San Diego at JCVI under one condition, and maybe in the environment that we're working in, there are genes that are uh, no longer, that could be actually non-essential? Yeah, it sounded okay. like, for example, they were using uh, cultures like on, on uh, agar plates to define the middle yeah. cell. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's reasonable. I have, uh, we, don't, we don't have any information on that. but. We assume that, um, yeah. I did not consider that issue, that, 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 that changing the conditions of the labs might change to what degree uh, a gene could be defined as, what, as essential or non-essential. So what you're saying is that there could be genes that are mutating that are actually, uh, we call them essential, but they're actually not essential. Yeah, I wonder, for example, if you can like say something about the stability of these proteins taking the mutated sequence yeah. and then see if they still fold, for example. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done that, but, um, and I haven't thought about that question before, so thank you. You know, just along these lines, so you, you didn't see any nonsense mutations, you know, premature stop codons, this sort of thing. Um, I think maybe we did, and I would need to go back into the, the tables in the supplement to, to, to know for sure, yeah. Because that would indicate that the genes, that would be a loss of function okay. probably, no? Okay. Yeah. I'll have to think about it some more. Thank you. <laughs> you could just look at a stare back at you. <laughs> we'll wait this out and see where we can go. Um, the, the, the point is that uh, we, we thought, well, maybe there would be some shared mutations involved in this common uh, quantitatively common adaptive change, and, and it, it's not. So they're evolving divergently, and it doesn't appear right now that the minimal cell is hampered in terms of uh, its, its ability to adapt. It's just doing it via different means at the same rate. Um, so there was one mutation, so I'm gonna, uh, this will be the last part of this story, I think. Um, 
I mentioned that there was these quasi-essential genes. And one of those is FTZ, FTZ. Um, and this is a uh, tubulin homolog uh, that orchestrates uh, the process of cell division. And uh, when this protein, these little monomers polymerize, it forms this dynamical Z ring at the center of the cell. Uh, and that Z ring recruits other proteins and other types of bacteria would be recruiting peptidoglycan. We don't have peptidoglycan in mycoplasma. Um, and so it creates this ring which is involved in regulating uh, and the division of the cell from, from one cell into two cells. Um, and so when that gene, non-essential gene was removed, the morphology and division of the cell got a little bit weird, so JCVI said, we're going we're gonna to keep it, even though it's technically uh, a non-essential gene. Um, FTC has also been observed to have effects when mutated in other populations of bacteria and archaea as well. So there's some good sense that this is a, something that's affecting um, cell size. It was retained, and so we thought it might be good for us to kind of, it was, it was hit in every single replicate population across all of our um, all of our minimal cells and non-minimal cells. So I, I convinced Roy that, that we should, um, I know in Europe people are really into microscopy. For some cultural difference in the United States, it seems to be harder to get people to look under microscopes, at least in the field of ecology and evolution. We're like wanting to sequence and sequence. And so I said, Roy, can we just look at these under the microscope, please? And so, and Roy's always responsive, but I have to use really strong logic to get him to do things. He's like, we have to do this because if we do this, then it will, and he's like, he's like okay, okay. We'll look at the cells underneath the microscope. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not too much. Um, and so we, we did that. And so these are uh, the, the sizes, uh, the diameter of these cells uh, measured through scanning electron microscopy. We also used um, epifluorescent microsco uh, microscopy. And um, so the non-minimal cell, this had been reported before in the science paper in 2016, that genome minimization leads to a reduction in cell size. It's a pretty small, we're talking like 300 nanometers, right? Um, and, uh, and then we can see that there's a five-fold increase in cell size over 2,000 generations. And statistically, we did not see an increase in cell size in the minimal cell. Um, so there are a couple things. So, so now, we've, I've told you up to this point that we see no constraints uh, on evolution due to minimization, but now we're seeing a big phenotypic change in something that's really important for uh, resource acquisition, uh, whole organism, metabolism, uh, efficiency, and how everything scales with body size, right? Um, and so we see that adaptation for the non-minimal cell, it goes up and it's accompanied by an increase in cell size. But in the minimal cell, we see increases in growth rate and adaptation, and it's not accompanied by an increase in cell size. So that's sort of a, a difference that, that, that struck us as being um, sort of interesting and potentially important. Uh, so what do you do in these? Because we have a synthetic organism, we could get the mutations in FTSZ. We told JCBI about them. We said, can you take those mutations that we observed in the experimental evolution trial and put them back into a clean background of mycoplasma mycoides synthetic cells, both the non-minimal and non-minimal cell. And we'll see two things. Can we re -pick, re recapitulate the effects on cell size and also test whether or not these genes and the mutations that we saw that were putatively adaptive are actually adaptive by doing competition experiments like we did earlier. So I'll show those results uh, next. Uh, on the left panel is cell size. So we put the wild type cells, the non minimal and minimal. Um, we can see si this is the same sort of data that we showed in the previous slide, but we put this FTSF mutation in there. Um, we see that cell size increases. We can recapture 60% of the change in cell size with this one mutation. Uh, and if anything, putting that mutation uh, back into uh, the non minimal cell, it does not increase size. If anything, it actually decreases cell size. But in both cases, that mutation, when put into a clean background, results in higher fitness. So this means that they're adaptive, and this means that we can recapture this, the changes in cell size with one um, essential gene that's involved in cell division, and regulation of cell division. Sorry, 
Yeah, um, I didn't. So these are non-evolved. These are the, 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 the cells that we started with at the beginning. Yes. They hadn't under, none of these cells had undergone evolution, the, the adaptive evolution. We're just going to step back. We're going to work with the non-evolved ancestors, and then we have mutants. So I'm just calling them something different here that's wild independent of, okay. of, of, of evolution, the evolution. So wild type is the stuff that you started with. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then the one on the right-hand column is the, the cell that had the observed FTSZ mutation from the, um, from the evolution experiment uh, crispered back into the wild type. So we've, we've controlled for everything. There's just one mutation that's accounting for these differences that we no, see. Sorry, I, I missed that. Uh, so on the right-hand side, uh, uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, the right side of the picture, of each picture, yeah. you have um, the cells that you evolved through these 2,000 generations. No. No. You're just looking at a single mutant. It's a, 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 the mutation that we observed from that experiment. We, we got that sequence. And we went back to the original stocks and we said, synthesize this mutation, take out the ancestral FTSC, and we're going to put in the observed mutation that we saw from the experimental evolution back in without any of the other baggage and other mutations that arose during so 2000. only a single mutation. Single mutation. Mutation is being compared between left and right. That's right. Sorry if that wasn't clear. Um, I've, I've had this question out a, a few times, but now I'm, I'm willing to ask it. Is evolution just maybe a better synthetic biologist than we are? Yeah, I think that's, um, I th well, I have some thoughts on that topic. We, we can talk about it now. Um, I'm not an engineer and I'm not a synthetic biologist, but I imagine that sometimes people, we, we think that we can create a certain organism that can do a certain thing to the, the way it should be. And I would say that maybe we can leverage natural selection to, uh, in combination with synthetic approaches to create organisms that can do things. I mean, uh, you know, somebody a couple of years ago just got the Nobel Prize for using directed evolution to, to kind of improve the, the, you know, the, the performance of enzymes, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, I think that, that, that would be one thing that you could infer that you know, maybe in the, in the field of synthetic biology, we should be thinking about not trying to preserve as a snapshot in time an organism and keep it free from the forces of evolution because that's inevitable that this is going to happen. And I would say in some cases, at least for certain functions, uh, whether or not fitness or cell size is important to you, then maybe those are things that we can uh, use in concert with synthetic approaches. Um, so here, fitness, do you think, is mostly due to the fact that uh, the, well, the non-minimal grows faster than the, than the minimal? Um, so, so which one grows faster? The, the, the non-minimal. Non yeah, they, yes, that's right. That's, that's just it, okay. Um, so you're talking about the panel on the right? No, 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 I'm actually thinking about the fitness, fitness assay um, that you showed before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, no, because it was, because in, in that case you grow them for one day, right? So yeah. the only important thing is how fast you grow in, in this that's cycle. That's right, yeah, maximum growth rate. It was basically what we're using for fitness. Uh, but, okay. but the head-to-head -head competition experiments here do capture something a, a little bit different. But we've also done a lot of experiments where we just measure kinetics and the, the, the growth rate, maximum growth rate of these strands. Those two approaches match up. Um, is that, is that was the? Yeah, the, yeah, I was just thinking okay. uh, what exactly this fitness assay reflects. And yeah, yeah, these are uh, also these head-to-head -head competition um, assays where we're competing um, experimental strains against the M cherry labeled, I think I said red fluorescent protein, uh, it's M cherry labeled um, reference strain. So I measuring its ability to increase in frequency relative to a, a labeled strain. Can I ask you another question? Yeah. Um, so you said that, these, uh, that the minimal cell is, uh, is very picky in terms of uh, mm -hmm. where they grow. So, so you had to be basically calibrate the media and then, the, and then evolve it uh, in this media. Yeah. Do you think, so let's say that you find another media <laughs> where it can grow. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can talk, yeah, I think there's, there's, a, there's a sub question there that you're getting at. The media issue is like, one, if you want to talk about media, th these are hard to grow and the, the media is really expensive. It's got like fetal calf serum and we're, we're supplying it with everything that it needs to grow because it's, it doesn't have the genes that are needed for that. 
think that's important for the types of questions. There's now defined media. Just last year, uh, this group from JCVI published a paper where they did a bunch of other things, but like nested within that, they've actually defined, uh, they've developed a, a defined media, which I think could be really important for flux balance models and, and like maybe simulating mutations and what we would expect to see. Uh, so that's, that's uh, interesting, and if we continue to work in this direction, that would be something we'd wanna um, include. But I think you're asking another question too, which might be is like, well, what if you tweak the media a little bit um, or the environmental conditions, would we see these same results? And, and that's something I've been thinking about Bit. And I was inspired actually by the, the, the talk we had yesterday, Eric's talk, was thinking about you know, what happens when you, um, thinking about noise in populations and how noise is propagated uh, under an organism that's undergone uh, massive you know, genome minimization. I think Eric said that there's only uh, you know, three transcription factors in these minimal cells. And so I've been thinking a lot about how that might allow organisms to contend with uh, and evolve in different environments. So it was a really Nice conversation we had yesterday. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so. I, I have a very okay. basic question about this yeah. plot. So the, the um, mutation uh, that then you engineer in the ancestral strain is a mutation that occurs in the non-minimal or in the minimal cell? Uh, that's a good question too. So what, what, what mutation was it? And I wanted to go back and look this up too. There are different mutations that arise in the natural selection that hit FDSE, but there's some subtle differences in what those mutations are. You know, none of the mutations are gonna be exact. I don't know which like, consensus sequence we took it from. It would have been either from the non-minimal cell or the minimal cell, but we, didn't, we only picked one and put that back into one of the cells. I have to go back and check on that. Just been thinking about that. Um, okay, so. Um, I just want to wrap up. I, I think we're, we're at the top of the hour now. Anyways, uh, you know, some people don't like these, um, these, these examples of thinking about fitness landscapes, but, um, you know, 100 years ago, we started to, to see these, these, these ideas being presented in evolutionary biology where you have genotypes that are mapped out on this fitness landscape that are being shaped not only by the genome, but also by the environment. And I think sort of can imagine that this non-minimal cell over 2,000 generations is marching up some kind of fitness landscape to an increase in its, um, its fitness. And then we did a genome, I didn't do the genome minimization, JCVI did the genome minimization, the reconstruction of the synthetic cell lacking half of its genome, and we can see that it's really sick, and so it's going into this uh, trough on the fitness landscape. And the question was, can it get out and if so, what is the path that it takes up that mountain, right? Um, and so it seems, like we don't know what the fitness landscape actually looks like. It could be really rugged and there's multiple peaks that are being climbed and the two, there's two high peaks. Uh, here I'm depicting it, there's just one, one peak. Um, but the, the cell seems to not be struggling with getting back up to that um, fitness maximum. And so, yeah, so, so this is a generalized model of like some, some ideas about how cells might evolve after undergoing genome minimization, which is really uh, quite common. Um, we see it in a lot of endosymbiotes of, um, you know, things like aphids, but also in the global ocean. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the SAR-11 Pelagibacter ubique strain. It's one of, the, it's the most abundant microbe on the planet, has an extremely small genome. So I think some of these findings are not only important for env environments of host-associated microbes that we know undergo genome um, uh, reduction, but also in free-living environments where organisms are important for carrying out important functions at, at, at global scales. Um, we've already addressed this issue about what, what does evolution mean for synthetic biology, and that instead of thinking about this as a hindrance or something that's you know, moving us away from a desired product, it might actually increase uh, the productivity and yield of, 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 of synthetic organisms. Um, and I mentioned a little bit about like the idea of models of, of origins of life and why I don't think this is really probably the organism to be asking those questions, but I think this approach could be used with other organisms uh, to gain insight about you know, what, 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 what a, a progenitor cell or a primitive life form may have looked like um, you know, three and a half, four billion years ago. Uh, and I think we also have this ability to think about general uh, questions in, in biology related to the evolution of cell size uh, why, in some cases, uh, adaptation is associated with an increase in cell size, in other cases it's not. Um, and we're thinking about also like building up. The next step would be, we've now investigated what happens with genome reduction. Can we recomplexify an organism? And I've been really thinking a lot about genome duplication 
and how that might be um, some a question where we can look at neo-functionalization and diversification of microbes in different environments due to relaxed selection on uh, a, an additional copy of a gene while there's preservation and, and, and uh, uh, stabilizing selection on another copy of gene. And we have the ability in this, in this, um, this, this platform of synthetic biology to actually construct a gene uh, where there are two copies and we can concatenate those genomes and perhaps use things like barcoding to, to test some of those hypotheses. So there, there are some financial um, things that I'm, I'm thinking about, but you know, taking these types of experiments and asking questions about uh, diversification and duplication as, as uh, organisms' genomes become more complex. So the flip side of, of, of simplification. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so just importantly, I want to uh, point out that, you know, all this work was uh, led in, in, uh, to a large degree by uh, Roy Moisier Reicher, who was a, a PhD student in the lab when uh, Will was in the group as well, um, uh, along with some people at the Venture Institute, uh, Arizona State, and uh, USGS. So, thanks. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks. yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was a uh, very interesting talk. And um, uh, I'm actually a bit uh, confused uh, trying to reconcile your last conclusion, I mean, some of your conclusions, in including the last one, uh, that's, uh, that Waddington landscape picture. Okay, yeah. With a slide that you had shown earlier. Um, so in this picture, you said, you seem to suggest that uh, both the blue and the red are starting at the same point. One, the blue is going up, the red is going down slightly down, right? Uh, Whereas that earlier picture that you had, I thought, uh, where you had plotted the relative fitness, I yeah. thought that um, they both started at a different point. They do. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the red one started at a fitness of 0 0.5, and the re uh, blue yeah. one started at a fitness of point, yeah. uh, at a fitness of 1, That's right. by definition. That's right. But both increased, it, uh, increased their fitness by the same amount. That's right. Right? So uh, how, does, how do these two pictures square with each other? I tried to capture that. that that's what I, exactly what I was trying to reflect in my cartoon drawing, but maybe, maybe it wasn't effective. So the, they both get to the same point at the end in terms of their fitness, or approximately, but there's initial, the cost that you're describing, the, the, fit, the 0.5 value of relative fitness versus 1.0, was reflected by that red arrow where it's moved, the genome reduction, the dashed red arrow, brings you down in the fitness landscape. I see. I see. That, that was what I was trying to convey. I was, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I didn't know. I have mixed feelings about whether or not this is a good metaphor for uh, what's going on in our experiment, but um, no, I tried I, it out. Okay, now that you've clarified, I, 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 uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, I uh, I'll try to make that clear. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, maybe a little bit long, the same uh, lines, um, not about the plot itself. But if you now evolve the minimal cell after your 2,000 generations and the non-minimal cells at the ancestral strain that both have a fitness of above one, yeah. do you expect that linearity to continue? I don't so know. So once they're sort um, of equal, you know, what happens? So, um, you know, the, the, the classical example to look to is Rich Lenski's work with E. coli where he evolved, um, you know, 12 populations over time. And um, the, the fitness gains saturate over time and have been fit to power law distribution. Some people debate whether or not that's the right model for those, but the point is, is that in the first 2,000 generations, which is the time scale that we have here, you see the most amount of adaptive evolution. And after that, um, it becomes more incremental over time, but still goes up. It's just a lot smaller. So the question is like, what will we expect with this organism, a synthetic organism, where 50% of its genome, will it keep on increasing linear? I mean, we had to put a stop to this so Roy could eventually graduate. But yeah, like, um, you know, I could imagine uh, with the right person we could continue to ask uh, these types of questions, yeah. I don't know. They're linear, though. There's no, there's no effect that, that within 2,000 generations there's any sign of leveling off. That was really fun, thanks. Um, we had this. Um, we, Jay and I had this fun talk on the way back from lunch yesterday talking about um, de novo gene birth. Mm -hmm. And we were, so, so are the genomes sizes just constant throughout all of this? The only thing that's going on is yeah. just nucleotide changes? Yeah, There's we didn't see, there are some, 
there are some deletions in the non-minimal cell, about nine. Most of them are, so not in the minimal okay. cell, uh, but in the non-minimal cell. And one of those is sort of big. I don't remember how big, but a lot of them are, like eight of them are small, and one of them is big. So this also seems like a good place to look for de, no de novo gene birth. So I wonder, yeah. Yeah. what do you have to do? Wait, or you have to mix in some other cells? You have to feed in some other DNA? I'm, w I'm wondering how you can get some, some genome growth. Well, my, my, my approach, which is uh, artificial, would be to just create it from scratch. Yeah. We have this chassis, this platform that we could use to yeah. Yeah. add back genes um, and instead of waiting to see them or, or not having the control to know which genes. So again, also in the LTE, I think we talked about this yesterday on the way back from lunch, the, the, the um, what is the, the citrate utilization example where there's an inversion there's a duplication, you get this dosage effect that allows for the initiation or potentiation, and then there's the refinement steps that happen later. Um, so Rich had to wait, I think it was 65,000 generations for a citrate utilization gene to undergo that process of, of, of duplication and inversion. Um, I don't have that much time left to, 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 to do that. So um, yeah, so one thing that's kind of interesting in synthetic biology is you could just like all rules are off, right? Like we doesn't have to necessarily mimic something that we've observed in nature. Uh, let, 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 let's try to build something up and maybe we can test general principles, even though it's not consistent with whatever we, what we see. Yeah, uh, maybe one more comment. I'm also getting really excited about the duplication idea. Um, there are people who um, have tried this, um, especially when they try oh. to, say, take some bacterium and try to um, give it the ability to degrade linen. Linen is this very difficult to degrade compound that's found in, uh, I think, wood and, and all these yeah, yeah, shrubs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, so they do experimental evolution for that, and they also need some sort of acceleration of it, and they look, are looking for gene duplication. So what they do is they create um, tandem repeats. So they, they take the same yeah. gene, and they sort of yeah. glue it together in a specific way. And yeah. the fact that it's a tandem repeat then yeah. makes it much more likely that yeah. um, you can increase the dosage of that gene. Yeah. And in this evolution, so this is, I think, Ellen Knightler, for example, that does this, um, you see that it's like a cassette. So you start with a tandem repeat, that's two genes, it goes up to like eight. Okay. Something happens, and then it goes down again. So I have been wondering, like, if you were to do the synthetic genome um, uh, duplication, you could just take two pieces of the, two copies of the genome and concatenate them. Uh, or you could do what you're suggesting is put copy one, copy, copy A1, copy the, the second copy in tandem together around. And I think I have to think more about why. Yeah, so maybe that would promote dosage effects. Yeah, so I think what happens is they create an artificial structure of two genes that are fused in a way that makes um, additional copies of this tandem much more likely at mm -hmm. DNA replication. Cool. Yeah, I just think, I mean, it makes me a little nervous because, like, if you're going to build a cell and spend the money to do that, you better have thought through all these things. And uh, I could imagine there'd be a lot of things that would be off my radar <laughs> when building an organism. Like, oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Uh, there's origin to replication. And, you know, yeah. And, and then there's also limits to how much material you can really just pack into these cells. So they're really small. You know, we're thinking a lot about, we've been talking about ribosome content in cells and growth rate and efficiency and, um, and, and the rate at which chromosomes are replicating relative to the division of the cell. So I think there's a lot of uh, things to consider. Um, thinking about all of this, um, do, you, do you think that if you throw a plasmid around, they will be able to take genes out of the plasmid or do you need, some, do you need something that they don't have? Um, do you think that these cells would, would take up a plasmid? Uh, I don't know the answer to like, that. Yeah. Like if you throw some DNA in the environment and uh, to acquire something through horizontal gene transfer, do you think they would be able to do that? Or, or is there is some specific machinery that they don't have? So I, I understand that this organism doesn't undergo homologous recombination, uh, but I don't know if that and, and there's no cell walls, but I don't know what, how that affects its ability to take up exogenous DNA through transformation. And I don't know, I, don't, I have no knowledge about whether or not mycoplasmas have or can obtain plasmids. 
have no that, clue why. <laughs> but that, that could, um, yeah, so I haven't thought about that. Uh, because I'm yeah. asking out of complete ignorance, so I don't know anything yeah. about my co-platform. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I think we can thank yeah, yeah. Uh, Jay so again much. for the three fantastic lectures.